anything from shuttle, from shuttle to space lab to space lab to Mir to ISS to the space station, we we flew on it, and um, and that was a fun fun stuff. To, that was a fun career. I highly recommend it to everyone, anybody. However, that's not what really why I'm here today, and nor is it because I'm Isabel's father. I'm here because I'm the brother of this lady, uh, Grac Graciela or Gachi, as we called her, was my sister, and she was on board. Uh, the uh, 737 uh, Max that uh, crashed in in Ethiopia uh, four years ago, killing everybody on board. And since that time, I've been I've taken on a role of a little bit. I guess you'd call me tech support. I've been working with a small group of uh, families of victims from the Ethiopian crash to help them navigate a little bit the. Um, the waters of the FAA and Boeing and regulations and all that sort of stuff, which is complicated. I'm a little bit of like an impedance matcher, you know, between that and regular people. Um, and in that role, one of the things that we try to do is to uh, make sure that the message gets out to try to prevent this from happening again. So we talk to the media, we talk to Congress, we talk to uh, uh, folks uh, that, that want to hear, that, that, that should hear the message. And about a year ago, or so I was approached by a good friend of mine who was a professor at UW in Seattle. And she said, would you mind coming and talk to my undergraduate ethics class? And I said, boy, you know, this is not a subject that I particularly look forward to talking about. And she says, yeah, but you know, a lot of these kids are going to go work at Boeing. And it would be nice for them to hear. Oh, she, she used other words, but we'll keep the talk G-rated. And it'd be nice for them to hear your message. And I said, okay, I'll go. And I went and I was very surprised at the reaction, uh, pleasantly surprised at the reaction, both of the students and of myself, because I've come to realize that the intersection of obviously my personal connection here with my background in my pedagogical expertise gives me a unique opportunity to talk to folks like you and folks that very soon are gonna be in the room when decisions are gonna be made, similar to the ones that led to these tragedies, to the Ethiopian and the Indonesian crash before that. And so I'm hoping that in a few years, and it'll happen a lot sooner than you guys think, uh, I know you're sophomores and juniors or whatever, but very soon after you leave here, you're come, you're, people are going to look to you and they're going to expect you to know what you're talking about. And your opinion is going to matter a lot. So I'm hoping that when these decisions are made and you're in the room, that you'll think about some of the questions that we'll raise today. I don't have a lot of answers. I have a lot of questions and some ideas. And, I'm, I'm, and maybe I'll have a few more at the end of the, of the talk today. This is not really a technical talk. Though we are going to talk a little bit about, you know, what caused the crash. This is more of a what happened when and why was this done this way? Who was in the room? Why were these decisions made? Kind of. So let's jump right in. And uh, let's first start talking about the aircraft. Now, I don't know most of you, but I will bet that you have flown in a 737. It is by far or has been by far the most popular um, aircraft, commercial aircraft ever made. Uh, before the crashes, I think it, it amounted to about 30% or more of Boeing's revenue. And uh, it was built in 1967. And in 1967, no one thought that the future was going to be a small twin jet uh, aircraft uh, with, uh, with, very, with you know, about 100 or so passengers on board. Everybody thought the future in 1967 was the 747, the supersonic transports, the Concords, that kind of stuff. That was the future. This was a little bit of the, the redheaded stepchild of Boeing. No one really wanted to work on it, but there were a couple of customers, local air, uh, regional airlines in Europe and the United States that really wanted it. And so Boeing put it together and they borrowed some systems from the 707 and from other aircraft. That's not to me say it was a derivative. I mean, it was quite innovative for the time. In particular, I believe this was the first commercial aircraft that only had two people in the cockpit. In the past, uh, there were three people in the cockpit. The 727 had a flight engineer, so did the 707, so did the 747. This one only had two people, only had two engines, and all that is important because this was supposed to be a low cost, low cost to operate, fly them in, fly them out fast, 
And some of the some of the features that made it low cost was the two engines and the fact that it sat very low to the ground. So you didn't need jetways. There weren't a lot of jetways around in 1967 to begin with, but you didn't need jetways. You could fly into secondary fields, not Boston, but Worcester. Think, think Worcester, not Boston. You know, and people would just get off the airplane, new people get on, and you'd be producing revenue very quickly. So that's where we stood in 67. And to say that it was not a top seller would be being generous. It really sold very poorly. And so much so that in 1971, Mitsubishi in Japan tried to buy the whole line from Boeing because they wanted to start an aircraft industry in Japan. That sale did not go through, fortunately for Boeing, because Soon after 1967, these were the two models that, that, were, that were originally developed. Soon afterwards, the entire industry changed. And as hard as it is to believe these days, uh, you couldn't just say, hey, I'm gonna start an airline. I'm gonna fly from Boston to Topeka and I'm gonna charge 69.99. You couldn't do that back in the 1960s. You had to apply to a board who would tell you where you could fly, when you could fly and how much you could charge. But then in the 70s, that all changed. It was deregulation, and it happened first in the United States, then in Europe, and then in, in pretty much in the entire world. And all of a sudden, airlines found that they were, in order to make money in this environment, they needed a really low-cost airplane that wasn't too big that they could fill up full of people and not have empty seats. And guess what? Airplane was perfect for that, the 737. And so they built, in the, seven, in the 1980s, they built another three models. Uh, and, then, and, then the, and then the 90s, in response primarily to the developing world and the amazing story that that is of the rise from poverty of a billion people, especially in Asia and in Africa. Uh, and all of a sudden, people had money to spend and they wanted to travel. And this was the perfect airplane for that. Low cost, flying around, and the distances worked out. And it was great. And so... Um, this is where we stood at the end of the 90s. And you can see, the only thing I really want to point out here is that notice the size of the engine, right? It got bigger and bigger here. The airplane itself tended to get a little bigger as well, though there was an outlier here, this, this, this small one that was for a very niche market. But those are the features as the, air, as, the, um, as the airplane evolved, the engines got bigger because they got more efficient. They went from turbojet to turbofan engines. And the turbofan engine means a bigger, wider cowling. And there we were at the end of the 90s, and that was it. I mean, it had been 30 years, good run for any airplane, right? Uh, and, you, and it had been a success by any means. And then the MAX happened. So before we talk about the MAX and how it was different, we got to talk about the accidents. So let's talk about the accidents. So what happened? In, on 29 October in 2018, Lion Air took off from uh, Jakarta, and about 13 minutes later, everybody was dead. The airplane had taken off, and as the pilots tried to gain altitude, the nose of the airplane pitched down. The pilots pulled back on the stick, and the airplane pitched up, but not quite up as far as it was before. It pitched down again, the pilot pitched up, pulled back, pitched up, and this ratcheting kept happening and the airplane kept doing this roller coaster, slowly ratcheting down until it crashed into the ocean. And it crashed in about 100 feet of water. And um, the impact was such that even though it crashed in 100 feet of water, a crater was created underneath. A few months later, on March 10th, Ethiopian six, uh, 302 took off. Uh, from Addis Ababa on its way to um, uh, Nairobi. And um, the same thing happened. The airplane took off, and I think it was only six minutes later this time, everybody was dead. The same roller coaster happened. The, every time the pilots would pull up on the stick, on the, on the yoke, on the, on the wheel, the, um, it wouldn't quite make it all the way back up and eventually crashed into a field outside of Addis Ababa. I haven't been there. I was offered the chance to go after the crash. I didn't really think there was anything to be gained by me going. A few months after, about six or seven months afterwards, we received notice that they had identified some remains. And of course, they were identified through DNA that I had provided. 
And uh, when we got the the, the remains in, in, in Spain, and I had to ship to Spain because that's where my father was and that's where we buried her. Uh, the, uh, the paperwork that came read kind of like an Ikea parts list. There really wasn't anything in there that was identifiable as, as, a, as a human being. So what happened? Soon after the crashes, we started hearing the words MCAS, 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 MCAS. No one knew what that meant. No one had ever heard it before. Most disturbingly, the airlines hadn't heard it before. The pilots hadn't heard it. So what was it? Well, MCAS was a system that took a, a sensor uh, from that's located here in the, near the nose of the airplane. It's called the angle of attack sensor. And that sensor basically measures the angle between the nose of the aircraft and the horizon. The first over, let's just assume it's that, this angle here, okay? And if that angle gets too high, if the pitch gets too high, it moves a motor that's located here in the horizontal tail. And this tail moves in such a way to counter the pitch up, so it pitches the nose down. And that's the way it's supposed to work. If this angle gets too high, this thing here, this motor controls it to push the nose down so it doesn't get too high. So why was it there? Why was it needed? Well, it was needed because of the engines. And remember what I said a couple of slides ago, as the aircraft evolved, the engines got bigger. Well, they got so big that they just didn't fit under the wing. And so the solution to that was to push them out and up in front of the wing. Not necessarily a bad solution. However, the problem is that you all know how airplanes fly, right? They create lift. The lift is created primarily in the wings. Their shape is made so that it maximizes lift and minimizes drag. But anything flying through the air creates lift and drag. It's just some are more efficient than others, including, unfortunately, this huge cowling around the engine. It creates an enormous amount of lift. But because of where it's positioned, this lift being, this engine being in front of the wing, it tends to pitch the nose up. So what happens? The engine placement generates lift, and this lift is created primarily during uh, times when the, when the airplane is trying to, to gain altitude. And so the pilot, imagine you're the pilot and you pull back on the stick, your nose pitches up, you start climbing. And then all of a sudden you notice that it's pitching up some more because this lift is being created underneath the nacelles and it's pitching up. And that's bad because if you pitch up too much, you get into a condition called stall. Stall is when you don't create enough lift. The stall is when the flow over the wings is disrupted enough so that you don't create enough lift and you, and you drop from the sky. Not a good thing to do. Even if you don't get into stall, when you get near stall, you get what's called a sloppy stick. And so your control forces aren't the same. Fighter jets have this all the time, but this isn't a fighter jet. This is supposed to be a nice, safe airplane carrying 157 people. So this pitch up is bad. It can either stall, you decrease control authority. And it's not the first airplane to get to have this problem. Airplanes have this problem, and it's usually fixed by moving the engines, by minimizing the lift creation, by gnarling the surface or whatever, by using some hardware fixes. But they didn't do that. They used software. Now, here's the first decision, right? In the, people got into a room and decided that they were going to use software to fix this aerodynamic problem. Now, soon after the crashes, I made the mistake of going on the internet and going to chat rooms and or Reddit or whatever. And, you know, never argue on the internet. It's just a bad thing. But there were a lot of people that said, oh, you know, hardware should be solved with hardware. Software is cheating. Well, sure, I get that. And sure, I wish that they had made that decision. But we've been using software in critical systems and aerospace systems since the 1970s. The space shuttle had five computers, all fly-by-wire. The F-16 fly-by-wire fighter Every fighter jet after the F-16 is in fly-by-wire. Every Airbus that has flown or is flying is in fly-by-wire. The 777, the 787, all fly-by-wire. 
which means that you have a computer in between the pilot inputs and the control surface, software in the critical path. We know how to do this. They didn't do this. They, they, we don't have to do this. They, we use multiple processors, multiple sensors. We, we check for redundant, we check for uh, faults, we, we compare, we vote. There's all sorts of processes in place now that show us how to do it. None of this was done for MCAS. MCAS used one single sensor, an angular attack sensor, that would activate repeatedly even after the pilots had taken over the control. It's sort of like if you're in the cruise control of your car and you step on the brake, disengage the cruise control, you take your foot off the brake, the cruise control comes back. Not supposed to work that way. And it was it, it actuated much more aggressively than any other comparable system. So that motor that was in the back there, the tail is used to do what we call trim the aircraft, which you, it, it's just something that you do to aircraft to make sure that they fly smoothly without too much force on the stick. But MCAS would activate 10 times with, with 10 times as much speed or force, if you will, than what than with the trim on the maneuver. So all that would have been okay if they had told people about it and allowed people to prepare for it and to train for it. But the MCAS existence was hidden during certification in order to, in order to make the certification of this airplane, the deployment of this aircraft, of this airplane from factory to the customers as fast as possible. So in the actual train, in the actual flight manuals, the word MCAS was only listed in the glossary. That's it. It's an MCAS maneuvering something on augmentation system. That was it. That was all that was there. Now, all this would still have been okay if you had used, if you were, if if you if you thought that an averagely a normal pilot would be able to identify what was going on and recover from it, what even if they didn't know what MCAS was all about. But when they were developing it in the past, they tested it and they tested it in simulators and they found that pilots weren't able to recover from it. And still they were convinced themselves, they convinced themselves that that was okay because well, it's unlikely to ever happen. It's such an unlikely situation that MCAS would ever actuate. And we're, we know what we're doing. We have the safest airplanes in the world. It doesn't matter that it was not supported by data. So when people ask me what went wrong, it's, this is it. This, this is the original sin. These are the original sins of why 346 people died in between uh, those, those six months in 2018 and 2019. The unforgivable curse. Did you it? So we're done, right? We know what happened. We can all go home and, and, make sure, and, and we can fix this and get on with our lives. But you know, in engineering, what is always easy in aerospace engineering because of data recorders, we knew what had happened within a couple of weeks of Indonesia. And we knew exactly what had gone wrong. The, the, the airplane crashed just off the coast of Jakarta. It was easy to recover the black boxes. They were recovered within a few weeks. We knew what had happened. And in fact, uh, in 2020, the FAA came up with a very good report that identified about six technical flaws that had to be corrected before the airplane was allowed to fly again. And these were by and large had been corrected. But you know, in engineering, what is always easy? Why and how is often very hard. And so that's what we're gonna talk about for the balance of this talk. Why were these decisions made? How were they made? And you know, what happened here? There's, there's a saying that, you know, success has many fathers and failures born an orphan. Unfortunately, in this case, it, it, the opposite is true. This, this failure, and make no mistake, this was the worst the economic uh, failure of the uh, civilian air, air, airline industry in history. I mean, the shutdown of the 737 production line for 20 some odd months had a measurable impact on the gross domestic product in the United States. I mean, that's how big of a deal this is. And, uh, but it had, there are many fathers. And so what we wanna do for the remainder of this talk is go through it. You know, when you're dealing with a complex problem in systems engineering, some, one of the tools that they teach you is 
to look at it through different prisms, you know, look at it in different ways and see if you can glean some understanding by looking at it through different prisms. So we're going to look at it through the technical, managerial, and regulatory uh, uh, prisms and see where the mistakes were made and why they were made. Try to understand why they could possibly go to where they made. Now, as we do this, I want you to, 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 to avoid thinking that, you know, yes, there's a saying that an accident or a crash is never one cause, right? It's a sequence of events. And that's generally true. However, that, that sometimes makes you think, well, if I just break the chain, the accident wouldn't have happened. That's a very simplistic way of looking at the, the things and is not true in complex systems, definitely not true in complex aerospace systems that you'll always have reinforcing loops and unforeseen effects, especially when you're talking about software, especially when you talk about software with humans in the loop. So as we, we'll talk about a few examples where you say, oh, you know, if they had just done that, the, the accident, the, the crashes wouldn't have happened. And yeah, sometimes that's true. But oftentimes, you'll see that they might still have happened anyway. So let's let's jump right in and start first with the easy part. We're all engineers here. Uh, you know, we're all engineers here. So let's talk about technical. The technical deficiency. So what I'm going to talk, I, I listed it previously seven mistakes that were made in the technical design, the single use sensor, the higher authority, et cetera, et cetera. Let me tell you why I think, how I think those made it into design, into the design. And the first thread that I want to pull on is the use of legacy systems. Now, every engineer that has ever worked for me got the lecture of don't reinvent the wheel. Don't reinvent the wheel. If you can buy it, buy it. Don't build it, you know, because it's always a lot more efficient that way. But what you always forget when you use a legacy system is that yes, you have advantages, but you also have constraints. And sometimes those constraints are simply not obvious, or at least not as obvious as the advantage. So what am I talking about here? The, 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 the 737 was designed 50 years ago. And at the time it used a, um, a, 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 an approach, an architecture that's still used today in, in most airplanes, which is a split cockpit architecture. One set of instruments on the left, one set of instruments on the right. The pilot sits here and she has the altimeter, the uh, artificial horizon, an angle of attack sensor. Co-pilot sits here and he has an altimeter, an artificial horizon, an angle of attack sensor, identical instrument, complete redundancy. Now, if you've been paying attention, I know you have, you may, you may have said, wait a second. I told you a few slides ago that there was only one angle of attack sensor on this airplane, right? But I just told you there are two, one on the left, one on the right. They are. But MCAS only used one. Why is that? Now, we can have an argument uh, of a computer, uh, computer scientists in the room and will tell you, you know, if you have two of anything and they don't agree, all you know is one is wrong, you never know which one is right, right? So put that aside. There was a second sensor sitting right there. And it wasn't used. Why wasn't it used? I don't know exactly why it wasn't used because even though I've asked many questions over the last few years, I've gotten very few answers. So let me tell you why I think it was. Because once you try to shoehorn 21st century technology into a 20th century architecture, you need to make compromises. And the compromise here is that since the cockpit is split down the middle, when computers started getting introduced, and they were introduced in the previous version first, it was only natural to only tie into one side, not, not both. Even though every single rule that we know of for designing it as, as systems with software in the loop and, and safety critical systems tells you not to do that. But in the, in the NG, they had a very simple autopilot, so it didn't make too much difference to, and the NG is the ones that were made in the 90s, they make too much difference to only have one. But when the MAX came along, since you had done it for the NG, and of course it was safe because it had been done in the NG, well, we'll just keep on doing it this way. And no one bothered to ask too many questions. So that's why I think, so there's an apocryphal story and I'm gonna tell it anyway. I don't think it's true, but I'm gonna tell it anyway. 
which talks about how the loss of the space shuttle Challenger can be traced back 2000 years. And it goes something like this. The Challenger was lost because of a blow-by through an O-ring that connected two rocket segments together. The rocket segments were segmented because they had to be shipped by rail from Utah to Cape Canaveral. By when you ship them by rail, they can, they, the maximum length is limited by the curve of the rail, of the railway system, the maximum curve that a, a train can, can make. That's limited by the size of the gauge, the, the width between the tracks. The width between the tracks in the United States was set by the width between the tracks in England, where most of our original locomotives came from back 100 years ago. The width between the tracks in England was set by the size of English roads. The size of English roads was set by the size of Roman roads. The size of Roman roads were set by the width of the, of the uh, Roman chariot axles, and that was set by the average size of two Roman horses' butts. Uh -huh. So apocryphal story, probably not true, but it goes to show you how you use, you, sometimes you use legacy systems and you accept them and you don't think of what constraints you're also buying into. And those constraints can have devastating consequences. Another example is the cockpit alert system. It's been in the news lately because uh, they just received, there, a waiver was just issued to allow them to continue to use this cockpit alert system. This cockpit alert system uh, that flies on the MAX and on all 737s is basically complies with requirements from the 1970s. Now, none of you were alive in 1970. I was. A few of us others here will remain in this work. But I remember the best technology in the 1970s. And uh, it would not be a surprise to, to, to you to, to know that cockpit alert system in the, in the 737 consists of Plaxons and alarms and shaking and all sorts of sensory overload that contributes to what's called the pilot startle effect. And none of the nice little flat screen, this is what's going wrong, this is what you should do. While all this noise is happening, the pilot is trying to control the airplane, the co pilot is desperately flipping through a manual, trying to find the right procedures to use. And that's what we're flying and that's what we're building in the 21st century. Why? Well, because of course it's safe. We've been doing it for 30 years. There's a word for this. I found out recently. It's called normalcy bias. It's the, it's the ability to convince yourself that things are going to stay the way they are, even though you have no evidence to back that up. And worst of all, even though you have evidence that tells you it won't. And it's common throughout engineering. It's common throughout, um, throughout our society. And you've got to be, as engineers, you have to be Watch out for you know, technology decisions in the 21st century based on things from the 1960s or before that can have devastating Well, that was, that's the first thread I wanted. The second thread is that design evolution and long timelines puts you on a slippery slope of, of just accepting that things will eventually be fixed down the line. What do I mean by that? Most people don't know that MCAS, when it was first put into the 737, used two sensors. Now, not the second angle of the right. That's crazy. But it used two sensors. It used the angle of the tax sensor and an accelerometer. And the accelerometer had to be above 1.3 Gs before MCAS would kick in. And this was done because originally it was only supposed to fire in a very specific maneuver called the corkscrew turn, where a plane is come. Imagine that you're a pilot, your plane is coming down on the runway. And all of a sudden, the truck run, drives across the runway, and you have to get out of there. But there's traffic all around you, so you basically have to corkscrew into the sky. Okay, and that's in that maneuver. When they were designing the airplane, they discovered that they had this pitch up move. So they said, "Okay, well, we'll put in we'll put in some software that will require that the angle of attack has to be above a certain amount, and that there be a one point at least one point three g of acceleration." And that would have been fine. A, because that maneuver never happens. It's just a requirement because it might one day, but, but also because with two sensors that have to fire, right? I mean, the odds of both of them getting messed up pretty slim. But then about a year or two later, they discovered they had a similar problem at slow speed. And at that point, I don't know if the person that had designed the first one was even still at Boeing because people move on, right? They come in, they come out. Tribal memory is lost. 
And they said, oh, we have MCAS. Why don't we just use that? Oh, well, we can't use the accelerometer. Well, that's okay. It's still so unlikely that it's going to ever fire. And besides, you know, we've been flying safe airplanes for 30 years. Of course it's safe. And it was just a beginning. And no one didn't, but then, but they never told anybody about it. When the, air, when the air accidents happened, the FAA said, well, we, we know about MCAS, but all we know about is this one, MCAS 1.0. They had no idea that there was MCAS 2.0. It only required one sensor. And oh, by the way, since it was only, it was, since it was working at slow speeds, it had to fire much more aggressively in order to get the same amount of fuel. So unfortunately in our industry in aerospace, but really across engineering, Things take a long time. The people that start the program often aren't the people that finish the program. And this, and what happens is because of this temporal lag, people say, well, you know, I'm somewhat, you know, it's, it's so far in the future and it sort of gives you an, an excuse to check out. And that's something that we have to, that, that we have to be aware of. So I, I, I'm gonna end the technical talk by just a question. You know, thousands of engineers work in this ocean. That's not an exaggeration, thousands of did anybody notice? I mean, my, my first meeting with the FAA back three years ago, I sat in a room a little bit smaller than this one. And, and I said, honestly, if any student had come, I was teaching a uh, like capstone class at the time at MIT. If any student had come in with this design, they would have failed the class. This is just so wrong on first principle. What, I mean, what was going, did anybody notice? And if they did, What's their responsibility? What are you going to do when you're on the room? I wish I had a good answer. Let's go on to the managerial deficiency. Now, this one is, you know, look, up until now, up until we started talking about this, everything I told you is based on facts. There are reports, there are congressional hearings, testimony. You can go back and check. There was, in fact, only one sensor. It, was, it did, in fact, actually, with high authority. All that stuff is true. Here I'm telling you my interpretation of that. So please take it that way. And there may be others, and I'm happy to engage in a discussion after the talk. But let's uh, but so I'm but this isn't a bash Boeing talk because Boeing, you know, has been for most of my life the premier aerospace company in the United States, if not the world. But this isn't your grand, your your parents, this isn't your parents' Boeing. What went wrong here? Here's my, here are the threads that I'm gonna pull on. The lack, oops, the lack of timely strategic planning creates a catch-up mentality. And you guys need to be aware of this when you're out there. If you're working at a company that says, oh my God, we have to rush, rush, rush. The fate of the company depends on it. But ask yourself, why are you rushing? Is it really, was it really unavoidable or was it somebody didn't do their job beforehand? Because here we have a situ situation where uh, Airbus, Boeing's main competitor, announced the A320 Neo. The A320 Neo is basically a 737. In fact, it uses exactly the same engines as the 737 Max, but the, but the A320 was built 20 years later and it sits higher up, so there's plenty of room to put the engines. So they announced this and they sold over a thousand units in six months, the highest selling airplane ever. And this was in 2011. You know, 10 years since the last version of the, of the Mac of the 737 had been introduced. So they announced this and Boeing is being told by customers, if you don't come up with something, we're going to jump and we're going to go over to the, to the Airbus. So Boeing announced the 737 Max and you have to deliver within six years because that's what customers expect and they want, they want it a certain way and rush, rush, rush. Okay. And developing a new aircraft can cost you $10 billion, whereas uh, the 737 MAX, the original price was three. Anybody care to guess how much they've spent since the crashes in, in compensation to the airlines for selling in the limit and in the read they do and everything? Anybody want to guess? I don't know the exact number. The last one I heard was about 20 to 30 billion. This 10 billion doesn't look that high right now. Right? <laughs> Furthermore, it had been 10 years since they built a previous, a new version of the 737. The market for a twin jet, for a, a twin engine, single aisle aircraft had not gone away. If anything, it had exploded even more with all the, especially in, in the developing world. So what was going on? Well, 
they, they spent $40 billion buying back their own stock. And in case you don't know what that means, that means that a company uses their own money to buy their own stock back, and that increases the value of the stock for the stockholders. And since the compensation of executives is usually tied to the value of the stock, it increases the compensation of executives. Are the two things linked? I don't know. Management isolation creates an echo chamber. Here's another big danger zone if you find yourself in a company that has all its production facilities here, and the managers all sit way over there. For most of its lifetime, Boeing was headquartered in Seattle. It had other fabrication places around there, but the headquarters and the main production plants were in Seattle. And then they moved to Chicago. You know how many airplanes are built in Chicago? Zero. Recently, they moved to Washington. You know how many airplanes are built in Washington? Zero. I had friends that went left, they were working in school way, way too long ago that I won't mention, but they went to work for Boeing. And they you tell me that as an engineer, you could walk into your boss or your boss's boss or your boss's boss office with concern and you'd be listened to. Now, it doesn't necessarily mean that you know they stopped the line for every for every issue that was raised, because sometimes an engineer may not know about other things that are going on. That's perfectly valid. But at least you were listened to. But now. If you're going to if you're going to um, talk to your boss, you're going to have to schedule it and get on a plane and fly from from Seattle to DC. So, how much of that interaction do you think is happening? None of it. None of it. None is happening. Furthermore, if the people in DC are only talking to other people in DC, and so they this echo chamber just basically convinces them that the only thing that's important is the things that are important to them not the things that are important to the engineers on the line that's seeing these airplanes that are going off the line with defective parts or whatever, or a design that's faulty. That's not important. What's important is their management incentives, and they tend to be based on stuff. So this disconnect from a technical staff is a major red flag in any company that you may end up working for. So I just, I just put it out there. One of the things that came out in this, in during after the after, during the investigation, there were a whole slew of, of of emails and text messages, and this one stood out for me. It says, "This is from one of the engineers saying this airplane is designed by clowns who are supervised by monkeys." Now, I'm all about, I understand blowing off steam. Hey, you know, you go out and have you have a drink with your buddies, and you complain about the boss or about the president of the university or about whatever it is. I'm, I know all about. That. But this wasn't an isolated reason. There were reams and reams and reams of a dysfunctional management system happening uh, during the development of this earth. Finally, uh, because we've gone from having three large airplane manufacturers to two, it used to be Lockheed, McDonald, and Boeing, then it became McDonald and Boeing, and then it became Boeing. You have one enormous company with a lot of power. And when you get that big, the regulators are no longer at the threat they used to once be. And so regulations are treated as, as fungible and secondary to high uh, level program objectives. And the highest level program objective at NCAS for the 737 MAX was it had to cost $3 billion, it had to be delivered on time, and it could be no different than the 737NG. A pilot was supposed to be able to fly at 737NG in the morning. And she'd walk across the, the, the terminal and sit in the 737 MAX in the afternoon. Okay. In fact, Southwest Airlines had a contract with Boeing that contained a $1 million per airplane penalty if any new training was required for the 737 MAX. That's why MCAS was hidden, because if MCAS had not been hidden, even the FAA, as as toothless as it is, as it was at the time, would have been able, would not would have insisted, or other agencies outside the United States would have insisted on training. In fact, one of the, the chief test pilots said in a in a in a text message, it looks like my Jedi mind trick worked again when he convinced the FAA inspector that MCAS wasn't a big deal, that it was okay, that no one really need to worry about. It. So I was in private business my entire life. This isn't a bad capitalism. No, no, no. I understand profits. I understand the need for profitability. This isn't a, a, a story of a bunch of 
guys sitting in a smoke-filled room twirling their mustaches, thinking of dastardly deeds. This isn't what theirs was. I am sure that no one set out to produce a bad aircraft, and yet they did. Why didn't anybody speak up? Was it because of the disconnect? Was it because of the air exchange? Why was safety secondary? Was it the normal seabounds? Of course they're safe. We're going. We make the safest airplanes in the world. What would manager, should managers do when cost and schedule, which is, especially in cost and schedule, which directly affect their near-term compensation, conflict with safety and not. Before we do the final uh, thing, uh, the final lens and talk about um, regulatory failures, but since I talked about pilots and pilot trainings, I have to say something about the pilots because there's soon after the crashes, there was a lot of talk about, oh, these pilots, you know, you know what they're like, Ethiopia, Indonesia. Come on, you know what that's like. It was the most racist, jingoistic, well, it was disgusting for Kim. And there was a lot of pushback I was happy with. But, but you know, you don't always, you don't, it's, it's, it's not enough to be right. When the message gets out and keeps getting repeated, you still deal with it. And even last week, NTSB came out with this report, uh, with a report saying, well, you know, if the pilots had had better training, well, you know, you can't blame the pilots for not having training when you didn't tell them they had to be trained in the first place. But nobody, for, everybody forgets that. But look, I'm not a pilot, so I'm going to leave it. But I will say that the pilots had thousands of man hours, except for this guy, Ahmed um, Noor, who was, a new, was new. And everyone goes, oh, see, he would never have been allowed in the cockpit of an American. You know, little American boys, and they're always boys, would, would know how to so solve this problem. Read the, look up the New York uh, Magazine article, and you'll see that I'm not exaggerating when I say it was a disgusting article. Uh, um, Ahmed Nur, Mohammed Nur would, uh, would, um, would never have been allowed inside an American airplane. Sure, but you know, the rest of the world doesn't have the benefit of the three largest air forces in the world to draw from when filling their civilian pilot ranks Army, Navy, and Marines, you know, the three largest air forces in the world. Uh, and furthermore, this isn't new. Boeing, we, we've been selling airplanes to Africa and Indonesia. They, Lion Air and Ethiopia were major customers. They've been supplying Boeing airplanes for decades. If you're now going to say, well, you know, you shouldn't, your, pilot, your pilots aren't well trained enough to fly our airplanes, well, maybe you should have said that before you sold it to them. But I'm not a pilot, so I'm going to let just let a pilot. And a pilot was in front of Congress, and he said, we owe it to everyone who flies to do much better than to design aircraft with inherent flaws that we intend pilots to have to compensate for and overcome. He's much more eloquent than I am. I, I just simply say, look, I have no doubt that good piloting skills can overcome crappy design, but it doesn't excuse the crappy design. Okay? The person that said this was this guy. If you don't know who he is, you may have seen this picture, and Tom Hanks played him in the movie, Captain Solomon. And as he said to the congressman when they started asking, he said, I know a little something about these situations. And yes, he does. I mean, he brought everybody back home safely after a once in a look and well, a, 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 a crash that should never have happened by the odds. Let's go on to regulatory deficiency. And it's easy to bash the FAA. And I actually have a lot of sympathy for them uh, because the FAA for the last 30 years or more have, has been mandated to move many of their functions from the government to private industry. And this was done in the spirit of efficiencies and competitiveness. We have to beat Airbus, you know, those, those, those nasty Europeans, you know, we gotta beat them. And, um, and some of it was unavoidable. And this isn't a Republican Democrat thing. This started back with Bill Clinton's reinventing government, continued with George Bush and Obama continued with um, uh, Trump and now has just been started to be pulled back after, after the crashes. And my main problem with this, I have no problem with efficiency. My main problem with this is that there's been a dilution of individual responsibility. And let me tell you what I mean. You, you're a good engineer and you're working at Boeing and you see something wrong. 
in the old days when we had the designated engineering representative, that's you, I'm sorry. <laughs> Didn't mean to zap you with my very low powered lady. Uh, you, as a, you're, my, you're the designated engineering representative, and you're a conscientious, good engineer, and you see a problem with a part, with a test, or whatever. You're going to pick up the phone because we didn't have email. Like you're going to pick up the phone and you're going to call me, FAA guy, sitting in maybe the Seattle office, maybe in Washington. You're going to say, hey, there's a problem here you got to know about. Get down here and we'll show you. Okay. Now, we're, we have the, or I always have to look it up because I don't remember what this acronym means. It doesn't mean anything. It means organization design authorization. I don't know. I know what a designated engineering representative is, right? I don't know what this is. Well, what this is, is you're still a conscientious engineer and you're still working at Boeing and you still find a problem. But you don't call me. You call your boss. And she listens to you and she turns around and talks to her boss, et cetera, et cetera, down, down up the chain. And eventually somebody call, emails me or calls me. Now we've all played the game of what's it called telephone, telegraph, or, you know. How do you think that works? How do you think that works when your boss, your boss's next quarterly bonus depends on meeting targets that are going to be totally messed up if you listen to that guy? By the time it gets to me, it's completely diluted. And even if it didn't get to me completely diluted, we go back to the previous problem of Boeing being able to make to be so powerful that it can have political, it can use this political clout to quash the uh, uh, power, which happened. So the FAA was surprised by MCAS, as I said, and I, and I believe them. I I believe. Remember the Jedi mind tricks. I believe that they didn't know what was what was going what was going on um, at, uh, with MCAS 2.0. And some of this is unfortunately unavoidable. These airplanes are complex machines. It's very hard for an agency to keep in house the expertise needed to to, to really look at what's going on at a place like Boeing. I've been a strong advocate of them relying on the National Academies. To draw from the expertise of the National Academy of Engineering to review systems like MCAS and others, because they clearly uh, don't have the manpower or labor skills within the building to do it. The other problem with the FAA was that, it, like most agencies in Washington, it's really two separate agencies. There's the top, which is primarily political appointees, and there are the workers at the bottom. Now, there's overlap. Sometimes the workers rise and become, you know, senior executive service kind of thing. But that's primarily true. And the problem with that is that the political guys can overrule the worker groups. Now, in the past, there had been broad consensus that for agencies like the FAA and the National Highway Transportation Safety Board, I mean, these aren't like, you know, a committee to name post office. This engine, these, these agencies are doing important work that people's lives depend on. There was a there was a consensus that they would not be politicized. That's all gone now in DC. That doesn't happen anymore. Everything's political. And I unfortunately don't 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 see a solution to this because um, the, the environment in DC is not going to change. And until that until that changes, political considerations are going to overrule technical recommendations. And I'll give you a very real example. After Indonesia, an analysis was done and they predicted 15 crashes, 15 crashes over the lifetime of the 737 map. It was expected to have a 30 year lifetime. So one crash every two years. Doesn't mean that any particular airplane would crash every two years over the fleet. But still, knowing this, would you get on board, Max? Nobody would. And yet, the airplane was not grounded because the political considerations of keeping the production line open and the impact of the gross domestic product, et cetera, et cetera, were too great and they were overruled. So um, that is a problem. And, um, and I, I actually am a little bit more optimistic about this one because you know this is a, ultimately a government bureaucracy and we can pass laws and we can pass what we did. And we can try to affect direct change. It's much easier than changing the corporate culture. Uh, finally, the last thing I'll say about, about the FAA is that, do, do any of you know what FOIA is? Freedom of Information Act? Yeah. 
So Freedom of Information Act was passed in the 70s after Watergate that said that you as a citizen, you can file a request for information that the government should give you in order to try to you know, not, not have things secret. That FOIA Act is useless. I swear to you, you can put a FOIA request asking for the color of the toilet seat in the 737 MAX and it would come back with that because it's all proclaimed. And the problem with that is that is that there are decisions being made based on proprietary information, particular cost information, and no one looks at it. This um, screw alert system that we talked about earlier was justified in, in, being, in being allowed on a modern aircraft because it would cost too much change. And we later have since found out that the, the estimates they were using for changing the crew alert system ran into the billions of dollars. Now, does that make any sense to you? I told you that a new airplane costs between three and 10. Changing the crew alert system is going to run into the billions of dollars? Of course, it doesn't make any sense. And if anybody had looked at it and said, hey, wait a second. And once it, once it became public, they said, well, you know, maybe it's more like 400 million. But I don't know, it was too late. Yeah, it was too late. No one wanted to sign up on the defective airplane. I have that, we have people that we're working with that are in counseling because they feel that they didn't do enough in trying to stop this from happening from the FAA. They retired and they work with us. They're basically whistleblowing. They spoke up, but they were overruled. So what do you do? And some of you may end up in the regulatory agency. That is a great career path. Where was the breakthrough? What do we, how do we prevent that? Let's just wrap it up and, and give you some parting thoughts. You know, it's easy to be frustrated by the complexity. Lord knows that, you know, sometimes I am. But the problem is that, you know, while it's human nature to look for simple solutions, hey, the pilots weren't good enough, or oh, the bird hit the angle of attack sensor, you know, simple solutions. Simple, so simple answers hide, can hide what really happened and can be used by people that really don't want to own up to what happened and make the changes that are required. Now, I've always been fortunate enough to work in an environment where, you know, we, we sort of eat complexity for breakfast in the ground, right? I mean, MIT and Oberlin, I mean, it doesn't scare me, shouldn't scare you. I sometimes go to these meetings and I already, I've, been, I've gotten a reputation. I, you know, I'm not pulling the bus. And because I tell them, look, if, if I'm not understanding what you're telling me, with all due modesty, you're not explaining it. And, um, but, but I get it. I get that it's, it, it's, it's human nature to look for simple, for, for simple causes. So sometimes when looking at complex problems, it's good to go back to what do you know for sure? You know, I know that sun's gonna come out tomorrow, okay? I know that tomorrow will be January 26th. I know something's for sure. So what do I know for sure about this problem? And I know three things for sure. The first one is that airplanes should not fall out of the sky because of one sensor. Period, end of story, end of discussion. Tomorrow, there is a hearing in Texas, criminal hearing in Texas, where Boeing's going to be arraigned. And I've been up to my eyeballs involved with what, what, what are the families going to say? And there's been talk about, well, what if, they, if the angle of attack sensor was hit by a bird? Or what if it was this? What if it was that? And I'm trying to convince them to stop it. Just stop it. Stop talking about it. It doesn't matter. I don't care if the angle of attack sensor failed because a bird hit it. I don't care if it failed because of electrical failure. I don't care if aliens zap it out of the sky with a phaser. Airplanes do not fall out of the sky because one sensor fails, period, end of story. That I know for sure. The second thing I know for sure is that you can't blame pilots if you don't try. So just stop. The, art, the, the, the stuff that's come out about these four, four, four people has been disgusting. If you have a chance to watch the Netflix documentary, on, uh, on, on this thing, watch it. And, and it's, it's heartbreaking what these people's families have been going through. And it's easy to blame them, they're dead. They can't defend themselves. Just stop. Train them and then you can succeed. And finally, and this is the one that is, that, that obviously really impacts me most, is that nothing new 
came out of the Ethiopian tribe. It wasn't there five months previously after the Indian War. Nothing. We knew exactly what. You should start wrapping up people in the early yeah. at nine ish. Uh, but the, uh, nothing new happened after the Indonesia, after Ethiopia. If there was reason enough to ground after Ethiopia, there was reason enough to ground after Indonesia. And everybody in that airplane, including my sister, 157 people would still be alive. So since I've been, I've been, piano is playing, I'm looking forward to uh, wrap it up. <laughs> I, I want to just say, what would you, I would ask you, what would you have done? A lot of people tried whistleblowers that come forward. Um, I have a theory, I guess you could call it. What's your responsibility? Doctors have the Hippocratic oath, right? My wife's a doctor, she took the Hippocratic oath. But doctors, when they mess up, not that she ever does, when they mess up, there's an immediate impact. Someone doesn't get better, someone dies immediately. Lawyer. Have the canon of ethics, you know, defend your clients to the best of your abilities. If they mess up, someone goes to jail right away, you know, or, or pay, has to pay a lot of money. What do engineers have? And I, I know in Canada, they get a little rain to remind of, of, a, of a bridge that collapsed or something like that that reminds them about, you know, being careful. Here's my theory as to why we don't handle it. Because engineers, even though we routinely make life and death decisions that affect a lot more people than doctors or lawyers. Those consequences are years in the future, years in the future. And that timeline makes you sort of, gives, allows you to not think about it. To not, a, a friend of mine, a professor on campus there talks about a lack of curiosity about what your decisions are going to end up uh, impacting and doing. And we have to, you have to be aware of this as you go through your career. Question what it is that you're doing and what it could be, and don't, don't, don't let, don't let them uh, not, uh, don't let them like uh, keep you quiet, because I don't want to see this again. Um, that's pretty much it. Uh, if people have to leave, they can go ahead and leave. I've always get, I always get asked this: Where do we stand now? Is it safe to fly? You know, that's the, that's the question everyone wants to know. Uh, in 2020. The group of families that I work with helped pass the uh, Aircraft Certification Reform Act. Uh, we worked with Senator uh, with DeFazio and uh, and Senator and other and Senator and people in the Senate to pass it, and it made some significant changes to the way aircraft are um, are are certified. The challenge now is implementation. As you know, Washington Congress passes a law, but how it's implemented is is is, is the responsibility of the agency. The modifications made to MCAS make it highly unlikely. That the crashes would repeat themselves. They basically now use the second time. But as we said before, two of anything, one goes wrong, what do you do? Well, their answer is that they shut down MCAS, which is better than having MCAS fly into the ground. But I asked myself, MCAS was there for a reason to prevent the pitch up, right? So if you shut it down, what happens to them? No. The crew alerting system is a huge concern. Uh, you're your children, if not your grandchildren, and I know I know how old you are, will be flying an airplane that has the crew alert system comprised with the best technology of the 1970s. So is it safe? Safety is always a trade. The best place for a rocket is sitting on a launch pad. The best place for an airplane is sitting in the hangar. The best place for you guys is uh, home in beds, doom scrolling for incident. Okay? <laughs> but every day, rockets fly. Airplanes fly, and you get out, get up, and go do something productive and useful. It's always a trade, and if I and and that's how I treat it. I like to fly JetBlue because I only fly Airbuses. If I had no choice, <laughs> if I if I didn't have a choice and I had to go somewhere and it was only a seven thirty seven max, I would take it. But if I had a choice, I wouldn't, because and not because of MCAS and not because I'm holding a grudge. But because it's a 50 year old airplane, no matter how much 21st century technology you try to shoot them. And that's it. That's it uh, for. Oh, this is a picture from a protest we, that I, some, one, of my, one of the people I work with organized in front of the FAA at the beginning of all this. My only objective in doing these talks is to not see any more of these pictures. 
I don't want to see anything, any, any more pictures added. So these are all people that died. Um, my sister's in there. Uh, I don't want to see any more of these pictures. So I'm, I'm, I'm grateful to give you the opportunity. I'm happy to talk anywhere at any time to people that you think might want to listen to this message. Uh, but thank you very much for hosting me. I know people have to leave online, but I'm happy to stay and answer questions and, uh, for uh, as long as, as, long as it takes. So. And if there are any questions online, and perhaps we could, if there are if there are any, we can start with those. I don't, uh, I don't, don't see have it. any at the moment, Javier. Yes. I so I'm not sure. One of the things I've been thinking about lately is business about Congress giving the the, the grandfather the uh, mm -hmm. rule about the theater. Yeah. And I'm wondering where, like, I've been torn on whether that's the right decision or not. I mean, I understand that there's a lot of sort of political power being used to make that decision what it was. But on the other hand, also, like, they were two planes into the new series of four planes. It's like, you really want, and I, this is, of course, a common argument, do you really want the other two planes mm -hmm. to have this new system and the other two not? Mm -hmm. Is it better to have them be different? And two of them be safer, or is it better to have them all be the same? Right. But the other thing that I feel like comes into it is all the other 737 is also learnings. Um, so the lack of true learning system is not a unique 737 max problem. I don't know. What do you what do you think about the approach to well can, can I ask you a question? Yeah. You, you drive, right? Yeah. What do you do when you when you're sliding on ice? Like in general? Yeah. What do you do? You try not to make any turns. Yeah, but, but what do you do with the brakes? Try not to use it. Well, you, you know, it, normally you slam on the brakes because you have probably an analog brake car. When I learned how to drive, well, I, I suspect when you learned how to drive, that wasn't what we were told. We were told to pump the brakes. When analog brakes got introduced, we all had to relearn. But there were scores of data tons of data that show that the relearning was gonna save a lot more lives than keeping the old system. The same is true here. The FAA didn't sort of one day in 2011 say, hey, let's have a new system. The first crash attributed to the, to the, to the crew alert system happened in 1996 on the 767, okay? Two more 767s crashed. One was Air Peru, the other one I can't remember. Since then, there have been Seven, including the two maxes, other 737 crashes where the crew alert system was uh, primarily or a contributing factor in the crash with about 830 deaths. So the FAA looked at all this, the Europeans looked at all this and said, you know, we've got to do something. And the way it's, it's, it's made to sound in this argument is that we're going to, you know, totally redo the entire cockpit, but that's not it at all. What we're doing is instead of having an alarm that means one thing if you're in the air and one thing if you're on the ground and you've got to remember all that and, and handbooks, you have a screen that says this is what's happening. You do exactly the same maneuvers as your training have always have that have you've always done in your training. But here's the other problem. The other problem is that that's fine for pilots that have been flying for 20 years, but these guys are going to retire. And you're going to have new pilots, a little bit older than, than you guys are, that are going to come in. And you all have a certain expectation as to how you interact with technology. And you're going to stand, you're going to get into this cockpit, and it's going to be like a time tunnel. Because instead of the, the nice, clean, crisp displays telling you what's going on, you're going to have all this stuff that's, you know, I, I gave this talk at Draper uh, last week, and I asked them, I said, you know, we're going back to the moon. Is anybody talking about using the same guidance computer that they used for Apollo to go back to the moon? Well, of course not. Of course not. But that's more or less the same vintage as we're talking about. So the, 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 the argument, this is an argument that is made for the public. Boyd has never made this argument to the FAA formally because they know that they don't have the data. And it's funny, I, I, I called up, I saw an article in the, in the Seattle, um, whatever, the newspaper there, had very good coverage on this, Dominic Gates, one of the Pulitzer. And I called him up because he was reporting this. And I said, Dominic, 
when they tell you that it's just as safe or safer, can you ask them if they have any data? Because I understand as a reporter, if, you tell, if you're interviewing somebody and they say the sky is green, you have to report that they said the sky is green, but you're allowed to look out the window. <laughs> So that, that's my answer. I'm, look, I am not an unbiased observer here, okay? I have very strong opinions. I, I, I will ask that you consider the fact that I entered this as an unbiased observer. I mean, I have, I have nothing that, and, and it's been four years of just one thing after another, and I just keep on shaking my head going, how, how in the world is this? I, I make a joke that, you know, the more I do this, the more I start sounding like Bernie Sanders, because I mean, I swear, it's like, you know, you can, there's no solution here. There's no solution to this to this problem at this company. Yes. Um, I saw you have the list of, of seven things mm -hmm. you asked. I guess I was curious throughout uh, throughout the presentation if like after the there were other similar issues like identified in the test that you know are, are were hidden or still under the rug or it it let me ask that question. The um the the when when this when this crash when this crash happened, uh, we got on a plane uh, the four of us, Isabel's sister and my wife and I, and flew to Spain that night uh, to tell my father he was still alive because I didn't want him to hear what he knew. And we were on the plane and I and I obviously couldn't see, but I was talking to Gene and I said, you know, I just don't want to be dragged into this. I don't want to be dragged into this because I know that this was going to be. And then six months later, I got a call from Nadia Milton, who was in Massachusetts. She lost her daughter. He said, can you come to the FAA with us? And um, and I said, oh, Nadia, why? Well, because you know we don't understand what's going on. And I went there, and it was clear to me after after thirty seconds of the presentation that they were just trying to get these people out of the room. And one of the questions that I asked in that meeting uh, was, "You need to find out who else was in the room when MCAS was approved, not for the purpose of blame, but from the purpose of finding out what else might have been approved." Now. To more specific, to, to try to answer your question more specifically, there are, this is a 50 year old, and there are compromise, there, there are decisions that were made 50 years ago that wouldn't be made now. There are issues, for example, with the control cables that run to the back to the, um, to the, to the, to the horizontal stabilizer, that they're not separated enough that they would be required by, by mod. I think that that's the issue. There's some issue with the control cables. There's a whole slew of little things like this. And, um, you know, I've been a strong advocate that there has to be a sunset for certification. After pick a number, 30 years, if you want to keep flying, you can keep flying, but you have to do the certification from, from, from the ground up because we can't keep it. And look, the 67 Mustang was a great air car, I'm, I'm told. <laughs> I don't know. It was, a six, it was a great car. But the Mustangs today are safer, more efficient. We don't let Ford keep building a 67 Mustang just because it was built that way for 50 years. Yes. Um, the curiosity was the switch. I think this may be not related to the point you're trying to make, but I want to ask it, which is that when these um, disasters happen, were there actions in the like that the pilots could have done? Super good question. Very good question. One of the criticisms that, um, so short answer, Indonesia, no, they were dead from the moment that airplane rolled off the assembly line, those people were dead. The pilots did not have the time to understand what had happened in the, in the you know, six minutes or whatever it was before they crashed to the ground. Sullenberg said in Congress that he went into a simulator and even knowing what was about to happen, he was not able to recover before it crashed. Now, having said that, after Indonesia, uh, uh, no, notices went out about this. Now, I have them. You should read them. Uh, I, I, you know, I, in my career, I had to write a lot of procedures for complex, like astronaut operations on the space shuttle, stuff like that. And I know, I know how to write procedures. And I say that if I was writing a procedure, if I had just killed a plane load of people, and I was writing a procedure to prevent it from happening again. The first part, the first, the first line of the procedure is make sure you get a good night's sleep the night before. The second part is, you know, kiss your children, have a good breakfast, you know, drive sick. I would be so meticulous in what I'm giving, the information that I'm giving, to make sure that nothing is left to chance. But the procedure that was put out 
basically reminded them that they need to do what's called the, um, the runaway trim procedure. Runaway trim, remember I said about trimming an aircraft when you sort of move the, the motor to, runaway trim is when the motor uh, goes crazy and it just starts, just starts turning and the, and the tail starts moving and the airplane pitches up and pitches down. And there's a procedure that pilots are supposed to know, which basically in short order involves pulling the plug, pop the circuit breakers, and then use a manual trim wheel to move the thing back. The problem is that that procedure relies on a lot of memory steps. You got to remember to turn off the auto throttle. You got to remember to turn this off. And that, that aren't, that aren't like, that may not be the first thing that you think about when all this stuff is happening and you're only a thousand feet off the ground, right? That's problem number one. And problem number two is that it doesn't present itself as a runaway trim. And a runaway trim, the motor is kind of, is spooling up and is pushing the, the thing one way and you're trying to fight it and it's not working. So you pop the power, it stops doing it, you move the wheel. Here, the motor is moving the thing, you pull back on the stick and guess what? Your nose goes up, it doesn't go up enough. You think, ah, and then all of a sudden, it's seven seconds later, it keeps sitting. So there was procedures and that's been, that's been our, that's, that's an argument that people are making that, oh, the pilot should have known better. But you know, I go back. I go back to the to the problem of of of, uh, of crew alert of the crew alert system. You're depending on 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 memories in high stress environments that just aren't there, and it's documented. We know a lot about human factors now that we didn't know 50 years ago. Yes. Speaking about the, the simulations, um, there's a side I mentioned like that testing like human response times will be will be realistic. I found that. Like pilots couldn't respond to it. Um, why are they like still so sure that it wouldn't be a problem and that it would be such a rare problem that it wouldn't happen? Normalcy bias. That's the only answer. It's it's been that way before. Of course, it's safe. We're boring. We build thousands of airplanes. You know, uh, and you see, and normalcy bias is really a challenger. The challenger explosion. Of course, the O-rings are going to hold. They've held. They've held for twenty four flights. It's crazy talk that it, it, it's they're not going to hold. You know, Southwest Airlines scheduling system, of course it'll work during the blizzard. It's worked for 20 years. Normal survival. I mean, people, you know, you have other things, you have other priorities, and you just convince yourself that, 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 that it's going to work. Yes. I guess, as um, all of you know, I'm a pilot, and I'm going to be graduate. Um, like, what is your advice to like avoid? Like this normal survival, like herd mentality that are well, I, I, I wish I had better advice. I've given I, I've asked similar questions I've been asking, and I and I give the, the same advice that you probably heard a million times. Uh, ment finding a good mentor that within the company is good. There's safety in numbers, sort of you know, flying court, but also be prepared to be wrong because as an engineer, especially when you're starting out, you may not know the whole picture. Now, if you walk into your boss's office and he says, oh, get out of here, you know what you're talking about. That's a bad boss, that's a bad company, get out of there while you can. A good boss will tell you, no, that's not an issue because of X, Y, and Z. I, I, I'm happy to keep talking, but I know people have to leave. Have to leave. So uh, why, don't we, why don't we end the-, the, the Yeah, the I'm just responding to a comment. Okay. And um, thank you for coming. <laughs> oh, thank you. That's how do I flip the camera back around? Yeah, okay. I think we're we're wrapping up here. Uh, Richard, I saw your comment. Um, I'll pass that along to my father. I'm not sure about YouTube, but um, I'll just pass it on your comment. And I think I have your contact information. So if he wants to send you an email about doing stuff with an education company and stuff like that, um, he, he can reach out. Thank you, Isa. Thanks, everyone, for coming. Tell your dad thanks. Great job.